welcome to Naturistic, a show about ecology, evolution, plants, and animals. Each week, I, Nash Turley, a biologist, research a subject in the scientific literature and present what I learned to my co-host, Hamilton Boyce. This week, we discuss antlions. Hello, Hamilton. One greeting and one salutation. <laughs> Hello, Nash. One salutation and one greeting to you. What do you, uh, what's an insect order? An insect order is the largest, the, the most broad organization of insect types that is available in biology. Like, for example, Hymenoptera. Yes. So it's a it's a group of organisms that all share something in common. Yeah, share an evolutionary history, and they have a shared ancestor at some point in evolutionary past. Yeah, and probably have certain characteristics that are relatively continuous throughout the group. Yeah, despite insects being so incredibly diverse, their organization is kind of nice because there's not an insane amount of orders. I don't know exactly how many there are. I think there's like 20 or something. Yeah. Um, And a lot of those are really weird, rare ones. So most insects fall in a few common orders. Um, So you mentioned Hymenoptera, which is bees and ants. What's a a few other common ones? Um, Hemipteroid. Is that one of the orders? Uh, Hemipterin. Hemipterin. Or Hemiptera, I guess, is a lot of them have Optera, which means wing. Right. So that's like true bugs, five five pointed bodies. Uh yeah, they don't all have five point there's one family of Hemiptera called Pentatomidae, which is well known for having five point bodies, but their most definitive characteristic is having a piercing sucking mouth part. Oh, okay. Cool. That sounds familiar. True bug. So if you wanna if you wanna really call something a bug, it better be a hemipteroid. Yeah, I, I, I totally like bug as a catch all term. Yeah. But if you wanna say it and be right. <laughs> <laughs> be really right <laughs> yeah uh, you'll find a pedantic entomologist now and then that'll say well that's not really a bug but it yeah. is very common vernacular to just call all arthropods bugs yeah and it's nice because it can be more general even than insect where like you can yeah. call a spider a bug for example right yeah i like the term bug a lot i think it's yeah. great Plus, insect is just a confusing word, and people think you're saying something that you're not, and yeah. <laughs> I try to avoid saying that right. <laughs> to non-biologists, to be honest. And it really, you know, it really bugs me when people just get on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Lepidoptera? Yep. Wait, Lepidop- okay. Lepi- yeah. Would that be the right ending for that one? Yep. So that means a scale wing, scale and those wing. are the moths and butterflies. Yeah. Um, let's see. What other kinds of... What other kinds of insects are there? Um, I don't know. I feel like I, I feel like I got three, so I should maybe just quit while I'm ahead. (laughs) Yeah. And those are, uh, three really big ones. You got, um, diptera, which are flies. Oh, right. Of course. Coleoptera, which are beetles. Ah, God, I should have got that one. As it's talking to Nash Turley, I really should have got that one. (laughs) That covers the most prominent ones. There's the big four Mm -hmm. and we mentioned the big four that are, have the, the most diversity of insects. And there's a whole bunch of others. There's Orthoptera, which is grasshoppers, and and, uh, Odonata, which is damselflies and dragonflies, and then a a whole bunch of others. Uh, But there's one other that is quite abundant and diverse, but is often pretty neglected, which is the Neeroptera, which is uh, partially the focus of today. And that means uh, sinew or tendon wing. And all, almost all neuropters have very lacy um, wings with lots of veins in them. Yeah. Is a lace wing a neuroptera? Yes. Tight. Do you uh, remember one time when we were, when I was uh, in an entomology class and learning all the insect orders and we were on a road trip? I do. <laughs> we were driving across the country to get yeah. you to Savannah River site in South Carolina, if I'm mm-hmm. not mistaken. And we were somewhere in Georgia. Yeah. And you had flashcards, right? Yeah. And and you got like really, not only were you learning them, like <laughs> I feel like you had already learned them pretty much. I mean, like you, you were obsessed. So you were like on top yeah. of it and you were starting to teach them to me. And right. I, at this point, had pretty much no 
Like I probably didn't know any of them. Um, yeah. And well, maybe I knew some cause I probably was also in taking biology or had taken biology at that point, but I definitely was, you know, learning and you got so excited teaching me. Right. Then we, I was driving. Wait, were you driving? Oh, you were driving. I, I, was, I was driving in the yeah. passenger seat with the, with the insect order flashcards. Yeah. And I think it may have also been family. So it was a bit more detailed. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, we were, we, I was definitely into it. It was the perfect, like while driving in traffic thing to, yeah. <laughs> to do. It's like, uh, an interactive podcast. <laughs> uh, and then we accidentally drove to Atlanta, into Atlanta, <laughs> right? even though that was not on our route. Yeah. So we basically like inadvertently got into many hours of traffic. <laughs> <laughs> it was like a rush was, hour in Atlanta. <laughs> yeah. And we we're like, wait a minute, where are we? <laughs> <laughs> Just like totally zoned out on navigation for like <laughs> two and a half hours or something. <laughs> yeah. Like, uh, I think we were supposed to take that highway, like a uh, hundred miles back. <laughs> the, the power of, of curiosity when it comes to learning about bugs. Yeah. Do you have any thoughts on insect learning insect or learning. preconceptions? Yeah. I mean, my, my instinct would just, dis- would be to say, that on an individual level, insects are probably not the greatest learners just because as far as like traditional measures of intelligence, I would say they probably rate fairly low. That having been said, I feel like there's always surprises and bewildering moments that happen in biology where there's unexpected superpowers that show up. So I would say I'm open to it, but I I don't know. I can't think of any examples of it. Yeah, I think I tend to agree. When you watch insects, they don't often portray a lot of intelligence. Their behavior is often kind of seems very instinctual. Yeah. And there's actually lots of insect traps that just kind of take advantage of that, like these nets, Mm -hmm. and they'll fly and hit the net, and then they just kind of instinctually walk up to the light. And then, you know, fall into a jar of alcohol or whatever. Right. So there's lots of their behaviors that don't demonstrate much intelligence. Yeah. Or that their intelligence is just sort of like narrow and very focused. Right. Intelligence isn't really a super easy thing to define anyways, but learning is also kind of its own thing that has its own definition that's like observing or seeing something, getting some environmental cue, and then modifying behavior in response to that. Yeah. Presumably in a way that's beneficial. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we're going to talk about some types of neuropterins and then get into some studies on insect learning. But the specific type of neuropterin is... Is that a spoiler alert? uh, That that we're going to talk about learning. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Like if if one of the chapters is insect learning... Yeah. I mean, it's not that big of a cliffhanger. Like you can guess (laughs) that the study probably shows that there was some learning (laughs) going on. Yeah. well, uh, not likely to have gotten published if there wasn't. Yeah. Uh, for better or worse, science doesn't do a great job of uh, sharing null results. Mm-hmm. We can get into that in another episode. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It is actually a, a a problem in science for sure. And totally. There is a there is some efforts to try to address that, especially in medical research, where studies have to be registered before they begin, so that if someone does a a bunch of results and gets all null results that's kind of in the record yeah um, which is definitely a problem in medical trials because they can do like a bunch of trials on one drug and like one of them out of 20 show a positive result and they publish that one but then the 20 that didn't just kind of go unseen Mm -hmm. and that's something they're really trying to avoid right and obviously the stakes are higher when it comes to medical research but there's that same problem in all types of scientific research. Yeah. It's called the file drawer effect. File drawer? Yeah. Okay. The data just stays in someone's file drawer. Yeah. Uh, and never gets published. Right. Because it's like not exciting and it's not a good read and it's not fun. But if someone's already done the experiment, then you're saving a lot of time and uh, possibly lives or yeah. whatever. Yeah if you're doing testing on animals or humans or anything. Yeah. So the first little bit here is just kind of an overview, a a little overview of Neuroptera and then getting into antlions, which is the main focus for today. And this mainly comes from uh, this big publication I found that's just called the Encyclopedia of Insects. 
and they have a chapter on each order. So starting with Neuroptera, I mentioned Neuroptera means uh, sinew or tendon wing. Often people say that Nero Neuroptera, the Nero means nerve, because that's what the root looks like. Mm -hmm. But I guess that's not actually what it means. It means Mm -hmm. tendon. Okay. There's about 6,000 species in Neuroptera, which if you compare that to some groups of animals, that's a lot. Uh, But for insects, that's really not that much at all. You know, for example, beetles have hundreds of thousands and so do uh, wasp and ants and everything. So yeah, as, as far as an insect order goes, it's a pretty small one. Mm-hmm. And uh, that includes, you mentioned lace wings earlier, uh, ant lions. There's a group called owl flies. Mm. There's some other things called dusty wings and spoon wings and mantid flies. And a lot of these have very like cowboy style names. <laughs> <laughs> dusty wing walking in. Yeah. I gave you a photo of a mantis fly. Okay. That um I don't know if you still have it or remember it. It's like a it looks like a wasp. Oh yeah, yeah. I do have that. I would never not have a photo that you sent me, but yeah, I that was a fairly recent one that you sent. Yeah, it's uh it's a very unusual group. They're also called mantispids. And so often they mimic a wasp, like a yellow jacket type look. Mm -hmm. But they also look a lot like a mantis because they have these big curved raptorial front legs, but they're not a wasp and they're not a mantis. They're a neuroptera of their (laughs) own family. Nice. They're, they're pretty wacky. They're really cool. Like the ant and the lion. Yeah. A lot of just, a lot of secret disguises going on in this, in this order. Yeah, that's true. Some of the lace wings do a really cool thing that I see every now and then where the larva They're predators. Pretty much all neuropterans are predators. And the larvae have this amazing form of camouflage where they basically make make their own camouflage by gathering up little twigs and chunks of lichen and moss, and they stick it to their body. Hmm. And so they just look like a little walking hunk of, you know, leaf litter or moss or whatever. And they're just prowling around to catch bugs. But if you look closely, you'll see these big jaws coming out underneath this like cluster of lichen and things. <laughs> it's a fun thing if you're, you know, I always like to stop and look at tree bark because uh, yeah. there's lots of cool camouflage bugs. And if you're really careful, sometimes you'll just see this little chunk moving around. It's a, <laughs> a lace wing larva. That's awesome. That's like the kind of thing that if you are the size of an ant would be yeah. terrifying to come upon. <laughs> it's like if we were walking around and an alligator just burst out of a shrub and... <laughs> chopped your legs off. So one uh, common thing to categorize for insect orders is the form of metamorphosis they have. And so there's two big words here. They can either be holometabolous or hemimetabolous. Okay. Is is that familiar? Have any memory of that? No. Holometabolous is kind of the very classic insect thing when we think of what like um, butterflies do. Yeah. They have two distinct life stages. They have the larva, uh, which is caterpillar, and then they pupate and they have a cocoon and then they go through metamorphosis and then emerge as an adult butterfly. Mm-hmm. So insect orders that do that are called holometabolous. Okay. So they have two distinct life stages. Okay. And there's lots of other insect orders that don't do that. So like um, grasshoppers, the orthoptera, that whole order, they're hemimetabolous. So every time they molt or shed their skin, they just change a little bit each time. Okay. Would that be considered an instar? Yes. Each Sick. each time they molt is an instar. So caterpillars have a bunch of instars before they pupate. And then grasshoppers have a bunch of instars before. In the last instar, they just have wings and then they're an adult. But they don't go through this whole metamorphosis stage. Okay. So neuroptera are holometabolous. So they have a distinct larval stage, and then they pupate and then have an adult stage. Okay. So the main distinction would basically be like holometabolus is like version A and version B, and there's one transformation from A to B. And hemimetabolus is more like evolutions through, well, I shouldn't use that word because it's loaded, um, but (laughs) (laughs) changes through like gradual changes through various stages. Exactly. Cool. There's a pretty amazing thing with Neuroptera, which is their whole life stage as a larva, before they pupate, they don't poop. <laughs> and that's the majority of their lifespan. They never defecate. And that's because in their larval stage, their midgut and their hindgut mm-hmm. are not connected. And mm. so everything they eat 
just kind of piles up inside them. (laughs) <laughs> some serious indigestion yeah and then is after they metamorphosize into adult they just drop a huge load <laughs> of all the food they ate during their potentially up to several year lifespan as a larva wow so <laughs> once they uh metamorphosize is that the right word uh-huh. yeah. then basically like their intestines are connected and they can complete the poop yeah <laughs> this is like <laughs> Okay, here's my here's my really <laughs> uh, bad analogy for this. It's like if you're dating someone and they're like really <laughs> afraid of like pooping around you because they don't want to like show you that you know that they're po- that they're able to poop. And then once your like relationship matures to a certain level, <laughs> then they're like, okay, I I first of all I've waited way too long and there's no choice. But now I'm also <laughs> comfortable enough so i'm gonna go ahead and just lay a lay a big one down (laughs) i think it'd be like that my only modification would be it would go straight from zero defecation anywhere within a hundred yards to directly to -to face-to-face toilets (laughs) (laughs) face-to-face toilets nice So one uh, possible explanation for why they evolved to do this is that as a larva, their hind gut, the sort of glands and stuff in their hind gut, instead of being used for the poop processing is they produce silk with it Mm. and they use that silk for various things. They probably use that silk to make that camouflage suit I was talking about, but also to um, spin their cocoon. Okay, so they're are they're already using that part for something else. Yeah, you don't want some poopy silk coming out, right? So the little uh, hypothetical quote I made for a neuropterin to explain this weird behavior, they'd be, "Well, I can't defecate, but I can make you this silk sleeping bag out of my ass." <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> That's uh, the opening of the play, the one man play, Neuroptera, <laughs> the, sta- the two stage play. <laughs> yeah, two parts, the Neuroptera monologues. <laughs> right. It's going to be a hit. Yeah. So uh, Neuroptera has 17 families. It's so perfect different... for intermission. Uh, all right. <laughs> <laughs> the, maybe the whole audience could participate by kind of coiling up in a nice silk sheets for a yeah. while. And holding their number twos. <laughs> yeah. Big rush in the bathroom oh, right, right before act two. Oh, my God. <laughs> uh, scatological. <laughs> All right. So there are uh, 17. Good thing no one's listening. <laughs> <laughs> right. We, we have uh, done a pretty good job of avoiding too much uh, exposure of definitely my uh, childish humor, <laughs> or scatological true, true humor. personalities. <laughs> the poop is out of the bag. <laughs> so there are, yeah, 17 families in Neuroptera. Most of them are amp- ambush predators in some way. Mm. And they do tend to have a consistent look in their larval stage. Uh, are you able to see this diagram? The body shape one? Yeah. Yeah. Tell me what you're seeing. I am seeing lots of different body styles and shapes. Some that look more like kind of a beetle, some that look more like a little mite or a crab, some that have bigger pincher things, some that are kind of have a little under, like almost like underwater (laughs) feeler things. And Mm. it's hard to generalize. I think the one consistent trait is huge jaws. Yeah. Little kind of parentheses shaped. Yeah jaws at the front of their face and uh yeah one of them has this really wild long neck yeah um and then uh one is very round with these like little feather-like feelers all sticking out that's an owl fly i'd really like to see one of those someday they're i think more tropical nice and then the last few are the are the ant lions ant lions is the myrmela e ontidae which i'm not saying right i'm positive but the start is myrma and that is a Latin root that's always related to ants. So they're associated with ants, at least in the name. Okay. And they are the most diverse group of neuropterans with about 2,100 species. Huh. So like almost a third of yeah. neuropterans are ant lions. Yeah. And they are most famous for making these sand pits in loose soil that prey fall into kind of like the big um, sand creature in uh 
Star Wars Empire Strikes Back. Oh yeah, which I know has a name that I don't remember. Right, the uh, the, the sand pit monster that um, Boba Fett falls into. Boba Fett, Boba Fett, where? <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, and we'll we'll get into that later. That's kind of the one of the main topics that we'll get to later, is because that's what they're most famous for. <laughs> Star Wars for eating Boba Fett. Yeah, yeah, they're. Mo- <laughs> Their most important contribution to history. Right. Extreme prejudice for bounty hunters. <laughs> uh, they are most famous for this um, Boba Fett slaughtering behavior, but there's only a small number of antlion species that actually do that. Uh, most of them actually don't do that. They are ambush predators in other way. They hang out mm-hmm. in crevices or, or whatever. Okay. And they also aren't particularly associated with eating ants either. You know, if they're making these pits, that's a common type of prey, but they'll eat whatever falls in. Antlions are common around the world, although they are most abundant in dry, hot places, especially grasslands and sandy areas. They are throughout the U.S., which was a bit of a surprise to me. Not as common up north, Mm -hmm. um, because I first saw them whenever I went to, came to the southeast. I think they're most common here, but uh, they are in California and up in the Midwest and stuff as well. Yeah, I don't remember ever seeing any in the Northwest. I bet you could find them in eastern Washington. Right. Okay, totally. Oh, uh, real quick. Um, the Sarlacc is the monster in the pit monster in Star Wars. Ah, good to know. Yeah, they say it's a fictional creature, but uh, they didn't cite their <laughs> evidence, their sources on the fictional part. So we'll just okay. have to... Yeah lazy scholarship really anyway. yeah good, good thing we got that in there i mean think of all the emails we'd get <laughs> right so uh ant lines a uh, lay their eggs in the sand or the soil and they have real stickiness to their eggs so they stick to the substrate they also have a common name of doodle bug especially yeah. in the southern u.s they're called doodle bugs I, mm. I found some sort of conflicting explanations for where that name came from but one of them is the larva um they'll make kind of marks in the sand as they're digging their pits, which we'll explain a bit more later. And so that could be like a doodle in the sand Mm. is one possible reason. Mm -hmm. The other reason, I guess doodle is sort of like a slang for being dumb or an idiot. Mm. As larvae, they sometimes act, if you take them out of the sand, they'll act real weird and look clumsy and dumb. So maybe they're called doodle bugs because if they're seen out, you know, and if you pick them up, they look dumb. I don't know. (laughs) Also, another (laughs) possible explanation is that people in that region use random nonsense words to describe pretty much everything that they come in contact with (laughs) for no seemingly no reason. So that could be, yeah, could be one of them. But both of these attempted etymologies could just be making stuff up for something that was just random. (laughs) Um, Amy has a, a doodle bug song that she grew up with oh yeah okay i don't she sang it to me earlier but i don't remember all of it but it definitely starts with doodle bug doodle bug that kind of vibe (laughs) k-i-s-s-i-n-g it has something to do with um i don't know all of your children are dead and there's only one more left or so she said you sing it when you're like digging up their their pits oh geez i was like this is kind of violent yeah i guess there's no shortage of uh highly morbid folk songs yeah that's the way they work yeah so uh, we we mentioned their big uh long jaws that are common among neuropterans including antlions and so these are pretty incredible so they're these big mandibles they're kind of like think of them as like big teeth although they're they're not really inside their mouth. They're sort of external uh, mouth parts. These mouth parts are, they're like a straw. So in they don't actually chew up food and eat parts of their prey. What they do is those big mandibles have uh, openings at the end that they use to inject venom and digestive enzymes into their prey uh-huh. that then liquefies it. And then they suck the juices out with <laughs> those big, sharp mandibles. That is gnarly. Yeah. Uh, so they're similar to hemipterans. We mentioned earlier the true bugs that have piercing, sucking mouth parts, basically the same as that. But instead of having one big straw, they have two big ones that can clamp down on their prey. Right. So the mandibles are like mouth parts. Yeah. Versus like, because uh, they kind of look like almost like crab pinchers or something, but those would be like limbs. Right. So different, kind of a different adapted, more like an extension of a, like a tongue or I guess it's the, it's the mouth. It's the, yeah, yeah, whatever, like the mosquito. Right. Yeah. Pretty much all insects. There's a bunch of different common 
parts on insects. And I forget the names of all of them, but there's like two or three different types of mouth parts that pretty much all insects have, mm-hmm. and, but they've been modified really dramatically in different bugs. Yeah. Um, so they kind of have this template that they all evolved of like three weird little appendages that they can do stuff with. Yeah. And all the different orders have evolved to do very different things with them. But essentially, like if, I don't know, it'd be like if we, it's almost more like our lips kind of. Yeah. So if you imagine different mammals have evolved their lip-like things, like a, you know, maybe a, a duck bill, a duck bill or an elephant, all these different like parts of their face that have evolved to do different things. Yeah. That's sort of similar to, to insects. How come more parts of our faces haven't evolved to do things? <laughs> <laughs> our faces are doing nothing. Yeah. Mammals are pretty constrained evolutionarily compared to arthropods, I'd say. Yeah. You know, because they're holometabolous, holometabolous bugs tend to have very different appearance in their larval form uh, compared to their adult form. So specifically in antlions, the adults look pretty similar to a damselfly. And so they're, they're pretty, they're not strong flyers that kind of bounce around and very easily confused with the, with the damselfly. And it's presumed that most of those adults are probably predators as well. It's possible they don't really feed. Lots of adult insects don't feed very much. Yeah, they don't feed, but do they poop well they poop at least once (laughs) right uh and actually that single poop is similar to i think it's called myconium in newborn babies their first poop is like this weird oily black thing because it's essentially everything they've digested Uh, in human babies human babies yes nice good to know Uh, right so if you in case you never heard of it you have a newborn (laughs) 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 don't freak out that you're new offspring squirts out this weird oily black stuff. So the adult male antlions have this pretty weird thing called hair pencils. They have these inflatable appendages that shoot out, which help them spread pheromones. So imagine it increases their surface area and then they can waft these pheromones to help attract a female. Wild. And there was actually a similar thing with lysenid caterpillars that we talked about in our first episode. The lysenid caterpillars had a similar thing, this like inflatable thing that right. would shoot out and, and release pheromones. Yeah, which were not called hair pencils. In the larvae, I don't, they weren't called that. There's a, I forget the name of them. There's a lot of other adult lepidopterans, moths particularly, that have hair pencils. Mm. And there's been some viral images of these mo- big moths that all of a sudden they'll shoot out this huge, almost as big as their body, these like squirt out this very alien looking hairy like appendages. Ah. Uh, it's really wacky. So if you, if you uh, do an internet search for moth hair pencils, you'll see some some weird things. Nice. The ones in antlions aren't as dramatic. You have to kind of look closely, but they're essentially the same thing. I'm going to um, just watch some of those videos while you keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it seems like a, a few of those weird videos get, you know, circulated every now and then. Uh, yeah, these are, this is a, a very alien. It kind of looks like a little underwater sea creature sort of yeah, looking around the back end. Yep. So let's get into some more detailed description of these pits. Yeah. It was kind of interesting trying to find some sort of reliable descriptions of these because the more recent scientific papers don't tend to describe stuff like that because that's not really the focus of the study. They just Mm -hmm. kind of have a couple sentences about it. So this is a cool opportunity to find a really old study that was way more natural history, just doing a bunch of tiny little experiments and observing, explaining exactly their behavior and things. So there's this study in 1915 uh, by Turner in the Biological Bulletin that really dives into explaining all these cool behaviors. And, And even in that paper in 1915, the author was saying, oh, there's been lots of descriptions passing in the literature, but no one's really reviewed it and done really detailed uh, descriptions. So it was exciting to, it was fun to read this old paper. It was, uh, it was neat. Nice. And the, the behaviors or whatever are the, like the pit building behaviors or the, or the actual, um, predation behaviors. This was like really focused mostly just on the, the pits. Just the pits. Yeah. This is just the pits. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So constructing them is pretty detailed sometimes. So antlions are pretty well known for preferring to move backwards. It's like they're the real good action and fast mobility they have is moving backwards. Mm-hmm. So a lot of antlions build their pits in this way. They'll be on sort of a loose soil or sand 
and they'll start by quickly jutting backwards, kind of in like a pulsing motion in a circle, in like a spiral. And as they go backwards, they're like using their flat butt like a plow and they're pushing it into the ground. Uh, so they're like pushing their legs, plowing their butt into the sand. Mm-hmm. And then they use their head to like fling the sand off of their body as they do that. Um, so yeah, so they're like plowing in with their butt and then their head is like thrashing back and forth to shoot the sand out of the way. Yeah. So is when you say it's a circle, is it kind of like a corkscrew motion? Yeah. Okay. So yeah, it goes in a circle and at first it's kind of on the surface yeah. and then it keeps like going around and around, slowly spiraling in. And during the process, as it goes, it's throwing sand out yeah. this whole so time. So it's going directly down towards hell? Yeah. Okay. It, it's, a, it's a shallow dive. It's not going straight. It's slowly spiraling down. Okay. So it's kind of going like along the surface, but like yeah. towards down towards Satan's lair. <laughs> right. That's the scientific term. Right. It eventually spirals around and around and is throwing sand this whole time. And if it's all loose, it'll spiral down and make this conical pit. But sometimes as it's going, if it's not, you know, a nice loose sand and there's bigger chunks, they, and if it's too big for them to throw out by like flicking their head, they have this alternate way to get rid of bigger chunks, which is they'll take this, if there's like a bigger chunk of soil, they'll move it up on top of their back and carry it on their back and Hmm. then kind of crawl out and then dump dump it off right. so they use their body like a little dump truck to haul <laughs> right. off the bigger chunks yeah yeah and they can have pretty astounding power to launching pieces up to like several inches up into the air yeah. as they flick flick the sand up with their head that's cool um and there are ones they don't all do this some of them just kind of burrow straight down but that spiraling one is a, is a common common method and so they typically end up with like a almost perfect looking cone uh in the sand that's about half inch up to two inches wide depends on how big they are. Mm -hmm. Once they've sort of made their pit like they like it, they burrow down um, to the very sort of the the pinnacle of the pit, the very bottom. Mm -hmm. I don't know if pinnacle is the right word there. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. And then they have their big jaws at the bottom of the pit, wide open, right at the bottom of this uh, sandy pit. Totally. Like it's a funnel and they are the, op- their mouth is open to the end of the funnel. Right. Yeah, exactly. You often can't see their jaws. It'll be just like right below the surface. And then when they're burrowed with their body into the sand, their, their whole flat body is up against the sand or the soil. And it's covered with these fine hairs all over their body, which they can use to sense vibrations in the ground. Okay. So their body is like lying down, like it's, it's flat parallel with the surface. Is that what you're saying? I think it's, it's either, I think it's more angled down. So like okay. they're facing straight up right. with their mouth right at the opening. Yeah. So it's like further deep, their body's down deeper. Mm-hmm. Do they have like little zones down there, like a little chamber? Or are they just like snug up in straight up in the sand? Snug. Nice. Yeah. So yeah, those, those sensory hairs are in direct contact with all the all the soil around them. Snug as a bug in a sand pit. And that's another possible explanation of why they evolved not to poop. Because when you're snug in sand, where are you going to poop? You just be getting it all over yourself. Yeah. You are about to poop on your own self. (laughs) I mean, I guess they could crawl out, but then, you know, they'd be exposed and they might mess up their pit in the process or whatever. So they're just, they're there for the long haul. Right. And these pits are normally in areas that are protected from the rain. So like under under a little log or under a tree or uh, not always, but, you know, I think that's more efficient for them if it doesn't get washed out every time it rains. Yeah. And it will have drier, you know, substrates that they can dig into. I feel like that one that we found in Orlando was just right in the middle of just a empty yeah. field, but maybe it. Yeah. Yeah. I think it was. And you'll find them there as well. More likely to be in protected areas, but definitely not only. Yeah, not a rule. Okay, so we got the setup. Um, Oh, yeah, there's one other explanation for why they might not poop is that if you're in dry areas and stuck in the sand, it can help preserve moisture if you're not defecating as well. So you're more efficiently using whatever moisture you get from your prey. Mm. So, um, all right. So I think we got the setup. Why don't, can you describe what happens when a prey item yeah. comes across one of these pits? Yeah, totally. So if there's a little insect crawling around on the sand, they basically catch the edge of one of these little funnels because they're kind of hard to see. They just sort of blend in, especially if it's like, I don't know if the lighting is, is even or whatever. And it's just sort of like, you're just walking along and you're like, okay, cool. 
you start slipping a little bit and you're like, oh, I'm sliding down into this, into this pit. Uh, and <laughs> uh-huh. I want to not be doing this anymore. So then they try to crawl out, but the edges are like angled enough so that the sand kind of like trickles down to the, mm-hmm. to the end of the pit. And the, all these vibrations also trigger the antlion's little hair sensor pieces, whatever. <laughs> yeah. Hair sensors. I didn't have a, a more specific name for it. But hair pencil is taken, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, but they basically, you know, they wake up the antlion and they're like, oh, okay, I got someone in there. So if they're sliding down and like if they're if they're successfully crawling out or whatever, the antlion starts shooting up little bits of sand at the edges of the wall mm-hmm. of the pit. And that breaking the friction there makes more sand come down and it'll, it'll be the sand that's underneath the feet of the insect. So then they start sliding down further. And it's basically like a combination of trying to crawl out of kind of a slippery angled pit and also having the ground come out from under you from Mm -hmm. some external stuff being thrown at it by the creature who is trying to eat you at the bottom. Yeah, I heard it described as like the moving sand creates like a perpetual mini landslide. Yes, That they can't run up. Yeah. So if, if they can't escape that, then they fall down into the pit and then there's just like a violent snapping close of the jaws on to the prey. Yeah. Um, and at that point it'll inject the venom, which will incapacitate them and liquefy and digest their innards, which they'll suck up. And often they'll even pull the prey fully underground uh, if they can. Mm -hmm. And then in some cases, apparently if they have a lot of prey, they'll, they'll drag it out. They'll drag the carcass out and just kind of pile it up (laughs) on the edge of the pit. Yeah. I also saw some of the um, super slow motion videos of some of the nature videos that were on the antlions where they were like launching the bodies out of the pits. Oh, wow. And they're like flipping through the air in slow motion. And then they're like landing outside the pit. So there's like sort of this ring of carcasses around the pit. (laughs) Just imagine being an ant. You're kind of walking along. It's like, huh, it's a bunch of (laughs) carcasses. bunch of carcasses and there's something going on (laughs) (laughs) all of a sudden you're just that makes sense because if they have the power to flick the sand out with so much force it makes sense that they could just hurl it yeah hurl the the you know dehydrated husk of an ant just out of the pit wow pretty brutal they can live in uh depending on how much prey they get uh sort of determines how long they stay in this larval form but some species have been shown to be in the larval form for up to three years Whoa. Uh, before they pupate and turn into adult. I think a lot of them, you know, probably a lot of species go through it in a year or less, but it's yeah. possible for them to be there for a long time. That's yeah, that's a, that is a long time, especially when you're holding your sh- poop. <laughs> <laughs> Nash told me I'm not supposed to swear. So. <laughs> It is, I sort of debated whether we have swearing on the podcast, but it doesn't really seem a necessary part of what we do. This is just how I express myself, man. That's the First Amendment. Would prefer to have it be fully open (laughs) to all audiences without any reservations. Cool. That's kind of our summary of basic antlion biology. Any other intro to antlions that you want to cover before we move on to some experiments? No, I think you nailed it. Well, uh, We'll be back right after this with a few studies. Well, welcome back. We've got a, a few behavioral experiments to discuss. Woohoo! Behavior is where the party's at. So this first study is by Karen Hollis, hopefully Mark Hollis's sister, who was at Mount Holyoke College in Massachusetts. One reason I picked this study is, uh, you know, it does look at some learning and behavior in antlions. It's also very elegant and simple. And then uh, kind of proved to be a great choice because I found another study that basically was a total follow up of it that used very similar methods. So that was nice. Uh, That'll be the second one we talk about. Did they reference the first study? Yeah, of course. They even said like using similar methods to this paper. Thanks, Karen. Yeah. Don't even need to uh, rehash all the methods because it's essentially the same. Uh, So this was in the journal PLOS One, 
which is a cool open access journal. Right on. So uh, no barriers to go read this study for yourself nice. if you want. Uh, so there's been a lot of insect learning studies. And one thing that didn't really make sense to me, but they made a big point of it in the introduction was that they've been very focused on insects that move around a lot and actively pursue prey or evade prey mm -hmm. or evade, evade predators. And so they were kind of saying, we don't expect there to be strong learning in a sedentary hmm. insect. I, I didn't, they didn't really have good logic of why, but in part, maybe just because most studies have been done on really active things. So there's sort of an expectation that learning may be more common among very active things and not among sedentary. Right. It's one of those things where you're like, yeah, makes sense. guess we'll just go with that. Yeah, I found it a pretty, a bit of a red herring setup, but the literature does seem to be underrepresented on sedentary things. So it's good to test some sedentary things like antlines. So they wanted to test if an antline could associate a vibration in the soil with the arrival of prey. And if they were trained to make that association, if having that training would help their growth or survival in some way compared to ones that don't have any training, like association between a vibration and then the arrival of mm. prey. So <laughs> this was kind of a cool thing. So to do this study, they actually purchased antlions from a company called antlionfarms.com. It's all focused on selling people antlions for classroom demonstrations or just fun at home with the kids or fun at home with the huh. adults. Uh, it's pretty cool. It's just like commercially available yeah, antlions. That's cool. Well, there's a dot com for everything <laughs> yeah. for every occasion. And it's pretty simple. All they had to do is just take plastic bowls and put sand in the bowls. And then you just put one antlion in each bowl. And there you have your environment, mm. one for each antlion. And they make their own cones. Yeah. They'll just do their normal behavior in that sand, waiting for prey to come along. And I, I've done this. Well, I've seen people do this before. One um, field station I was at here in Florida, they had collected a bunch of them and they had kids come to look at them. So it's very easy to do. You just kind of, they can be a bit hard to collect in the field because they dig really fast. Mm -hmm. So you have to like scoop up the whole area. Um, otherwise you'll right. lose them. But if you do that, they'll be in there and they'll just make the pits once they're uh, not being disturbed. Nice. You have to sing the song too when you're digging up the pits to find them. Right. And so um, in the study, they split them half and half. They had 38 antlions and then half of them got like a training learning treatment and the other half uh, was a control. So the learning treatment, what they did is before they would feed them, um, they would give them a cue by dropping a very standardized set amount of sand onto the surface of the sand. So they basically did, they had like, a measured amount of sand that they would sprinkle mm -hmm. on. And then right after that, they would feed them. In the control, they gave the same sand cues, but it was just at a random time, not associated with feeding in okay. any way. So they still fed them. They still dropped the sand, just not at the same time. Right. So it's essentially the same, like the classic Pavlov's dog mm -hmm. experiment, where he like rang the bell yeah. and then fed the right. dog. It's essentially the same setup, except I don't know if Pavlov included a control where he just rang the bell at a random time, which he should have. If you ever look at the methods for that study, it's kind of gnarly. I don't recommend it. Did it involve like some sort of dog uh, torture? Pretty much sort of deconstructing some of the like the salival glands of the dogs and stuff. Anyway, oh, okay. it's a bummer. So let's not talk about it. <laughs> So this, they chose this vibrational cue for two reasons. One is that it could be a reasonable simulation of like vibration on the ground as like a, you know, prey item walked up mm -hmm. to the pit. And then second, they saw no noticeable change of behavior if they did that, you know, before they trained them. So just on its own, it didn't seem to induce any, you know, observable change right. of behavior. Although based on the results it Maybe it could have, but anyways, so it doesn't seem to be associated with anything just on yeah. its own. Yeah. So the way they fed them was a little strange. What they did is they took a live mealworm, which is a tenebrionid beetle larva. I forgot the common name of those beetles. I don't know, maybe they don't have one. Meal beetles. Anyways, it's a beetle. So they're really long and skinny. And what they did is they, it's kind of weird, but they cut off. They, they said they gave them a quarter of a live mealworm. So they cut off and they gave them like the head in the first segment of the body. I guess they did that because it like they could standardize exactly how big yeah. the prey was. A quarter of a live mealworm. <laughs> right. And I'm sure it like wiggled yeah. around for that 
you know, right after they cut it. Um, and they just dropped it right into the center of the pit. So it's a mealworms aren't that agile anyways. And they'd like cut its butt off. So it was a little weird to me because they're not really testing their ability to capture the prey because it's like the easiest thing for them to capture ever. It's never going to mm-hmm. escape. And then they even said like, yeah, basically every time they gave them the mealworm, they caught it in a right. it. So the, they're not studying their ability to capture the prey. They're studying if when they capture the prey, do they have different outcomes if they've been trained to associate it? Okay. What kind of outcomes are we talking about? Like if, if they eat it every time, what kind of differences are there? So th- what they measured was the time to pupation. Mm. Um, so it's like a measure of mm-hmm. growth and also maybe an important measure for survival and fitness in the field. Because if you take longer to pupate, you're more likely to die either just because you starve or more time in the field means more likely to get eaten by a predator or to get cooked in the sun or flooded in a storm mm-hmm. or whatever. So the the faster you can um, develop into adult, mm-hmm. the better. So that was an important metric for them. They just measured how long it took for them to pupate. And uh, they ran the study for 70 days and they fed them every day, or I think it was like five days a week or six days a week mm-hmm. or something. The main result was that the learning treatment, the the antlions that had the learning, so they were sort of primed, like the dog primed with the bell, they were primed with vibration before being fed. They tended to throw sand more after they got the cue. And it was still pretty rare, but at least one behavioral thing they could measure was they seemed to be associating prey capture behavior with the sand cue. So that's one thing. But the more important result was that by the end of the experiment, 79% of the learning treatment had pupated, where only 35% of the control had pupated. Hmm. So having that learning, the ability to sort of pre-sense when a prey is coming, increased their pupation rate, almost doubled it. Okay. I don't I don't understand, but I'm going to let you continue. Yeah, I was very confused okay. too. So it's like, well, they're not catching the prey more. What is it that they're learning and why is there a benefit? Yeah. So it is a little bit unsatisfying, but they have some speculation. Okay. That's what I'm here for, the speculation. <laughs> right. The simple outcome is like, it seems like they are learning something. They're associating something with that cue that they're getting and it's benefiting them yeah. in some way. So whatever it is they've learned to respond to that cue, it's almost doubling their rate of um, mm-hmm. pupation. So the one possibility is that when they hear that sound, they're actually like priming their digestive yeah. juices. Something about their venom or their digestive things is better primed to then get better uh, resources from their right. prey. Like a like Homer Simpson if he sees a cheeseburger and he starts drooling. Yeah. So that's that's possibility. And the second is that it could have like improved their prey handling efficiency in some way, like the way they grab them or mm-hmm. something. There didn't really have any evidence that it was different. So that doesn't seem overly likely. So the only explanation that is maybe this like priming of <laughs> some sort of digestive yeah. ability, maybe not really so classified as like a active change in behavior could be even be more like a subconscious right. response. It's still considered learning. Okay. Learning doesn't have to be like you're consciously making the choice. Like it's associating one thing with another mm-hmm. thing and so that it benefits yeah. you. So it's still, I think, mostly fits. Stomach learning. Yeah. So yeah, it's pretty simple. So that's kind of like early study showing that you could have these methods to train them and see responses based on this kind of cues. So the the next study, which really followed up from that, was by a bunch of people in Poland. And the name of the university and all their names, I have no way of uh, Mm -hmm. pronouncing, so I'm not going to try. (laughs) Going to have a lot of consonants in a row, probably. And this was published in the journal Animal Cognition in 2016. They use very similar methods. It was a much bigger study, and they had lots of different treatments and different like cues and stuff. And so, uh, but it was the same idea. They had these vibration cues and then give them different things afterwards to see if they could associate these vibrations with prey or other activities. But they also were able, they also varied how big the prey they got was, and then also had like a treatment where they would um, lose the prey. They basically steal the prey (laughs) away from them, Um, similar to like if a prey was to escape. So these are kind of more components that are coming into it. And so the first part, they wanted to see if they could learn to associate the size of a cue, like how much vibrations there were with the size of the Mm. prey. And this ties into a big um, body of theory in ecology, which is called optimal foraging. 
And so it's it's the basic predictions are actually very simple. It's basically like if you're a predator, you have some cost benefit analysis to going after prey. And so if it takes you a lot of energy to capture a really small prey, maybe you mm-hmm. won't do it because it's not worth it. And so there's some optimum between expenditure of energy and how much energy you get that, you know, balances out and that's optimal foraging. So there's like clear predictions of that you can make. Probably similar to like if you're watching a nature documentary and there's a bunch of gazelles and there's a there's like a lion and they're trying to decide which one to get and they're like that one's big yeah. and it's weak and that one's fast but it's young and this one's whatever like making those calculations. Yeah, exactly. So normally catching prey is an energy intensive thing, so it makes sense that either would be some important decisions to make. It's not always just catch and kill mm-hmm. everything. <laughs> uh, you wouldn't expect that from a lion, but we also don't expect it from pretty much all mm-hmm. animals. So what the this part of the study, what they did is they um, the learning part of it is pretty simple. Basically, they have they the the learning group. They get a small cue and they're given a small prey item in a big queue for a big prey item. So if they can learn, they're learning to associate the strength of the queue to how big of prey they get. And then the random, very similar to the previous study, was just kind of no association between queue size and how big their Mm -hmm. prey was. So they would train them for a certain period of time using that same, whatever treatment they were, they got that same treatment for, you know, a couple of weeks or something. And then after that, they would then mix it up and see how they respond. Okay. So they had groups that were groups of individuals that were getting control random and associated size. And then after they trained them, then they would like switch it up for the different groups. Yeah. So yeah. So there's one group that gets the consistent, accurate cues of size of vibration to prey. And then the ones that don't. And then during the experimental part where they're collecting data, they they do the opposite. They give sometimes they give them a small cue and a big prey, and sometimes they give them a big cue and mm-hmm. a small prey. So if they learned it, they would they would realize something was off. And if they did had no way, if they were given no training beforehand, they would be predicted to not behave differently if there's a mismatch between the cue mm-hmm. and the prey. This reminds me of the Mitch Hedberg joke about the uh, the, <laughs> okay. the cinnamon bun uh, scented candles. So he's like. I would light it (laughs) and give my roommate false hopes. (laughs) Yeah, false hopes. So that's that would be similar to having a a big signal and a small prey. If they've learned, they've expected a big prey and then they get a small one. And so what they measured after they did these different combinations was basically if they expended the effort to catch the prey or if they rejected it and they were just like, throw it out. Nope, I don't I don't bother. Are these people also dropping decapitated mealworms right into the center of the hole or are they doing a different? Oh man, I really wanted to know the answer to that and I couldn't find it in the paper. So they said they use similar methods. So it's possible that encapsulated was they did the same prey, but they didn't say that. So I would guess that they also did that, but I'm not positive. Because let's just Um, assume that it was slightly different because otherwise they don't like, to me, it seems like they don't have to do anything to catch them if they just get dropped right in the, right in their mouths. Yeah, (laughs) right. Yeah. The the potential cost seems low. So yeah, if it was a prey that could escape, it would make more sense. Anyway, it doesn't really matter. Um, The concept is still the same. Yeah. They, yeah, they just, they described it as rejected prey items, not escaped prey items. So seems more like they were just like, Nuh. they threw it out. Like, I don't yeah, know. Not even going to, not even going to um, chew. So the, the main result here is that for the antlines that had been trained, the learn, the learning group, if they were given a large signal and then a small prey item, 61% of them rejected it. Huh. So that's, that's the, uh, the cinnamon bun candle. They were like, that's like getting angry, basically, (laughs) kind of, I guess. So if, if their expectations of prey size didn't line up with what they actually got, they were like, I'm not even going to bother. And they just oh, reject it. Okay. I agree with you that it seems weird because it's like, well, it's food. Why don't you right. just eat it? It suggests that they've evolved a, a, an association of expectation. And if you get a too small a prey, it's not worth yeah. your time. It, they've got principles. Right. Even if maybe that doesn't make a whole lot of sense because, well, one thing is that it could take a lot of energy to produce the digestive enzymes. And so if they're injecting all of them and they're not getting enough back, it may not mm-hmm. be worth it, even if it doesn't take a lot of energy to catch yeah, them. Like I made a bunch and this one's small, so I'm going to just not use them because that would be a waste. It's like, yeah, I, I prepared digestive juices for a big prey and this one's small, so I'd rather just save it 
for a big, you know, big, right. it's like, on. if you think you are having like a really big, important, fancy date and you have this like really expensive <laughs> bottle of champagne and then like the person yeah. cancels on you and then like your buddy comes over and like cut off jeans or something. You're like, okay, I'm not going <laughs> to crack open this 1942 bottle of <laughs> champagne. I'm just going to. Is champagne even something that you drink old versions uh, of? I guy mm, why did you have to ask me that <laughs> <laughs> uh i don't know but the the idea yeah. makes sense yeah it's a very a date metaphor focused episode today yeah just ironic given that it's such a violent <laughs> <laughs> violent right. topic when they're given the situation of they expect a large prey they got a small 61 percent of them rejected it in the learning group in the control group, 0% of them rejected mm. it. So the training they got, the learning they got, seemed to make a really big difference in how they handle prey. And the way they responded was consistent with optimal foraging theory, that their expectations doesn't meet what they got. So they're like, eh, forget it. But if they don't have any expectation, they don't have any learning, then they'll just take whatever they yeah. can get, even if maybe that's not a good foraging yeah. strategy. Wow. That's quite the difference too. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, this study, they didn't also look at the pupating rate to see if that learning helped them, mm -hmm. um, which would have been a good way to merge both studies, but they yeah. didn't do that. So the second uh, part of this experiment is they were looking at if they can adapt to the potential for prey to get lost, to like escape or yeah, basically prey to get stolen or to escape. Mm -hmm. And this happens in um, the wild a lot, you know, like we got, like we, in our description of them trying to get out of the pit, some of them will. And like, I think even when we did this in the field, if you pick a too big of an ant, they just basically run right out because the slope isn't steep enough and stuff. Yeah. So their pit method is unideal. It's not, it's not a like perfect death trap. It can only catch a certain type of prey. Yeah. So often prey will escape off. It could get snatched up by another wasp or a bird or whatever. But also ants have also been seen to participate in like rescue activity where they'll like <laughs> help another one get out. So that, that can happen as well. That so cool. that, yeah, prey gets lost in the field a lot. And so one thing they can do to either help prevent prey from escaping or getting stolen by other things is to bury it really quickly. If they get a, a jaw into it, just pull it underground right away. Yeah. And so in this, this the, the treatment in this case was uh, the learning group, they were given prey and then a vibrational cue, and then they took the prey away. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Very rude. And yeah. they wouldn't always do that, but they only got the vibrational cue right when a prey was then lost. So they have some cue that a prey is likely to escape, basically. Okay. And then the random again, similar, like they would just, the prey would get lost sometimes and they would get the vibration cues at random times. So they have no way of guessing when prey might escape. So yeah, so the question is, does having this cue, some sort of environmental information that a prey might escape, change their uh, behavior and how they bury prey and how fast they process prey? Yes. And it doesn't matter. Oh. Boring. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> So the result is the, the learning group was that 92% of the learning group would bury prey when they got the cue. Whoa. In the learning group, almost basically all of them would bury the prey and only 35% of the control group would bury the prey. Dang. Three times more likely to bury it. They also looked at time. They buried it faster mm -hmm. um, and a few other measures, but they were similar effect sizes. So it's the same idea. Uh, so they're responding. They have a cue and they've learned to modify their behavior because they have information that this is prey that's likely to escape. So that's much, I think, much more focused adaptive behavior, like changing their behavior to benefit them based on environmental information. Totally. That feels more rewarding as far as like understanding what they're experiencing. Yeah. Yeah. Feels more smart. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, whether it is or not, I don't know, but yeah. I think we're often sort of more biased to things where it feels more like an active decision, but mm -hmm. it is a, seems like it's a more change of like specific behavior rather than maybe what could be change in physiology, yeah. even though there's no, like, I don't think there's a great reason to see one as more important than the other, but it seems more dramatic. Mm -hmm. It seems to me, it seems more like cognition based. I don't know if that's mm. accurate or not, but I feel like, I don't yeah. know, you know, like the, the Pavlov's dog thing, like you don't, I don't think that dog has to have a brain in order for that training to work. Really. It's like super like physiological. Whereas like 
if you're yeah. doing an action that you have to decide whether or not to do that action. I mean, but you know, who's to say, maybe the action is very much like just a physical reaction. So it's hard to say, but that's just like kind of my yeah. impression. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it pretty quickly gets into the philosophical idea of what is cognition. <laughs> yeah. Or what is learning or whatever. Like is someone that has PTSD, like did they learn PTSD or is that like this yeah. other kind of side effect or you know what I mean? Yeah, a lot of sort of the ideas around cognition is seems focused on things being some sort of conscious response. Mm -hmm. And it, that seems important, but I, there are, I know there's debates on that and this seems similar here. I mean, we can't prove it either way. But I agree with you. It seems more like it could be hinting at some more conscious response when it's like getting a cue and actively changing its behavior. But, you know, behavior responses can be very kind of instinctual as well, just totally. like our fight or flight responses. And we do behavioral things all the time that we're not aware of. Yeah. Totally. So it's maybe if you really had to try to argue, it's probably not different without other studies mm -hmm. than like changing the physiology. Right. But often ideas of sensory ability and learning and behavioral responses is really without being able to ask your subject what they're thinking, it all comes down to information. Is there some sort of information they're getting and are they responding to that in a way that's adaptive yeah. or different? And you know, the same types of studies happen with plants as well. If they have reliable, consistent information, they can change all, all sorts of stuff. Yeah. And most people aren't comfortable calling that behavior. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think it is. And lots of other people, well, some other people do as well. Because why is that any different than an animal sensing behavior and changing its physiology, its behavior? So you could say that you study plant behavior? Yeah. That's cool. Some people do. Some yeah. people say that. Yeah, I think it's always a bit controversial, but I think, um, you know, it's it's coming around a little bit. So antlions, you obviously knew some bit about antlions going into this. Why was that? I am in the throes of editing our antlion episode that we filmed, uh, I don't know, two years ago in uh, Florida. <laughs> and uh, well, we've, we, I took a trip out there and we had filmed a bunch of content for a f like a handful of different videos, pretty much everything we've put out in the last couple of years filmed on that trip or not everything actually, but most of it. And, um, so this is one that was like, just a, we didn't even plan it. We just like came upon an ant lion in the field and you're like, there's an ant lion. Let's see what we, let's see what we get. And then like, I happened to capture the predation in action, um, on camera, yeah. witnessing it firsthand and then, um, having you kind of give a little description and then just sort of doing research and stuff about that watching a lot of uh, David Attenborough documentaries about him and stuff like that. Making me wish we had a high magnification and slow-mo cameras. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, cool. So we'll have a, a little short episode, at least being able to kind of show a lot of what we talked about here. Yeah, I'll try and see if I can get it done for the time or around the time that this comes out. Uh, so check that out. That's over at youtube.com slash naturistic. And then, uh, yeah, we got the normal things. Got any comments, or questions, send them over to naturisticseries at gmail.com. And maybe we have an um, idea hotline where if there's some topic that people are interested in, we could certainly consider it. Yeah, for sure. That would be a cool way. If you've made it this far, you get your own episode. <laughs> There's got to be at least one person that's listened to seven episodes now. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Anything else? Um, I have one question. So the studies are there on antlions. Would you say that the study was more like using antlions? Those studies were using antlions as more like, oh man, what is the term? Like just a... A model organism. A model organism. Or would you say that it's they were more interested in antlions specifically? Hmm. I would kind of put it in the middle between those two. Okay. And it's a bit hard to know. I mean, a bit of that is more kind of like in the head of the researcher, what they're excited about, mm -hmm. which normally never comes across in a dry scientific paper. Right. So, you know, it could be the case that Karen Hollis is just like an antlion fanatic and just wanted to study antlions. Right. And then the study has to kind of justify it as a cool system to study behavior or whatever. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's possible. I would guess it's maybe a bit more likely that's more of maybe a little stronger on the model side of like, here's a cool, an insect that is very convenient to do these types of behavioral experiments with. 
Yeah, you can order them on antlionfarms.com or whatever. <laughs> yeah, and it's like really easy to get them to participate in prey capture behavior, which can be quite tricky. Like spiders, like a lot of interest in studying behavior in spiders, but often they'll only feed like once a month or something. Oh God, yeah, that sounds and they like won't. a nightmare. So like these antlions, you can feed them every day. They'll just keep eating. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And like you can observe them really easily. They don't run away. You don't even need like complicated cages. You just put them in a bowl. <laughs> right. They won't leave the bowl. Like there's a lot of reasons why it's very convenient. Yeah. Totally. And uh, for better or worse, a lot of biology is kind of done by picking systems that are just like convenient to do <laughs> the experiment on. Totally. You're like you need 30 salad bowls and Internet Explorer. <laughs> Yeah. And some sand right? and some very patient people that are going to give a chunk of a worm to an antlion and then steal it away. <laughs> right. <laughs> so it's very detailed, but like, as long as you, once they figured it out, I think that's another reason why that first study sparked a bunch of other studies. Cause they showed, Hey, there's a very simple method. Yeah. And then you just tweak it in pretty subtle ways and you can answer a lot more complicated, interesting behavioral questions using yeah. essentially the same methods. Nice. So yeah, a little a little bit of both. I mean, I think there's that's another, you know, kind of highlights where so many of the other families in Neuroptera, they're so little known about because people don't see them all the time and they probably don't have a system where you can easily do experimental studies like this. Totally. So it's just like, well, how do you study, you know, the prey capture behavior of an owl fly that is only found in tropical rainforests and like crawls around on leaves and branches and stuff and like it's just much more baffling. <laughs> yeah. It's like, if I'm going to go to the rainforest, I'm going to study something more fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Things can become a model system pretty quickly if someone shows that they're a good uh, system for doing stuff. Totally. And that's pretty much how all model systems start. Yeah. They weren't a model system before they, then all of a sudden they were. Yeah. Profound. That is often due to a lot of work of someone just like demonstrating that they're great for cool experiments, basically. Right. Kind of like a 57 microphone and you're like... These things are $100 and they sound pretty much good on whatever you put them on and they're yeah. readily available and therefore they would just become a workhorse of recording and live sound. Sure, FM57, they are embedded into rock and roll history and also presidential history because it's the default microphone for a long time for presidential speeches. Nice. They just stick like a cluster of like 20 of them up there and duct tape <laughs> right. them together. and <laughs> Yeah. The exact microphone I'm using right now. Oh, yeah. So topical. Um, Have you seen that uh, Portlandia episode where it's like the music studio nerd? (laughs) I don't think so. It's pretty awesome. He's like just going around the studio and it's like telling you about all the gear and everything. And he's like, oh, yeah, this is this is a classic piece of equipment. You know, oh, yeah, no, they use this on pet sounds and stuff like that's his catchphrase. And he gets to the the 57. He's like, oh, yeah, they. They use that, they use this on pet sounds, but you know, it's, it's only like, it's a 57, it's only like a hundred bucks or whatever. And everyone has them, but you know, but they did use it on pet sounds. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's been a while since I've seen it, but that's the gist of it. It's pretty good. Good, uh, gear nerd comedy. I can tie that into ant lines. Nice. So one of the stories about what's the main beach boys, do, Brian Wilson, Brian Wilson would like to bring in sand to put underneath his piano and like oh. have sand on his feet while he was recording. Yeah, he had a he had a sandbox in his living room that he had a grand piano in. Yeah, yeah. So just throw some ant lines in there, and you got your own predator prey study right there in the studio. Nice during pet sounds. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> ant lines, they were there during pet sounds. Great. <laughs> <laughs> and if you have an ant problem in the studio, problem solved. <laughs> right. <laughs> Do they eat cockroaches? They'll eat pretty much anything. I think that was something I I left out. Um, They're not, they don't discriminate, but it has to be like small enough that they can catch it. Nice. Well, that feels like a pretty solid uh, conclusion there. Cool. Uh, Well, thanks for listening, everyone. And uh, thanks for teaching us, Nash. Yeah. More cool facts next time. Peace. Peace.